Okay, tonight we're going to talk about predestination, and I, I thought I would do that uh, since uh, Sunday morning in, in Acts, we kind of looked at some parts of it, and then uh, tonight I want to look at predestination, but what I want you to notice now is the very first line in your notes there on the page that says predestination. This does not cover foreknowledge, election, or chosen. Okay, and we'll talk about those later on, and we'll kind of touch them a little bit tonight, because most of the time, when somebody says predestination, or when somebody talks about something like that, they just lump everything all together, and it's all one thing, and that creates a lot of, a lot of problems. That creates a lot of misinformation, and when you read the Bible, you read in certain places that it says something instead of thinking what it says, you're already thinking something else. So tonight is just predestination. And the reason why I say that is because, number one, it is only used six times in the New Testament. The word predestination, the Greek word that is translated predestination, is only used six times. And what it means is, is this in, your, uh, in the second line there, it means to limit in advance. It means that whatever it is going forward that God has predestined, he's put limits on it. And he said, this is, this is all it's going to be. So it, it's not so much like when you uh, read in the Old Testament, uh, you'll, you'll, one of the prophets will say, well, thus saith the Lord. Okay, well... That, that's prophecy, that's, that's God's decree, that's God's will. But when he predestinated something, and what I find interesting is there's really not a predestination in the Old Testament. There's not a word, there's not a, that teaching is really not there. It's in the New Testament. And we're get, people get messed up. It's, notice what I said. The word is only used six times. And it's only used in three places. So of those six times, two of them are, are right here in two verses. Two of them are right here in two other verses. And then you've got the other two times that it's used. And we're going to look at those real quick tonight. And then I want to get into Ephesians chapter 1 because that's the, the big predestination passage in, in Scripture. That and Romans chapter 8. And, and we'll get there in just a minute. So first of all, in Acts chapter 4. And when you read and study... Uh, things like this in particular predestination let's say you get go to the back of your bible and look up the word and you know in, in your uh, the index in the back or maybe you get out your strong's concordance or something and you look it up and you start reading all those things don't just look for the word itself but look at the context of where the word is used because when you read the word predestination that's going to be one of the interesting things. It, it is used mostly in relationship to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's how the word predestination is normally used. So in Acts, beginning in Acts with chapter 4, verse 27 and 28, and I, I printed it out for you on these pages in the, the Christian Standard because that's what I've been reading and studying lately. And a part of that, I, I enjoy it. The other part of it is because some of the schoolwork I'm doing is in the Christian standard, and so the stuff that I gotta write and do, I have to do it in the Christian standard. So, but I'm really liking it. it it's a good translation, and uh, it reads a whole lot like the New King James. So it, it's kind of based a little bit toward the New King James. Anyway, Acts chapter four and verse twenty-seven. So the uh, Peter and John have been arrested. They were brought before the Sanhedrin, and so now they're they're out. And they are praying. And if you'll see in verse 23, it says, After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And so they begin to pray. And you get down to uh, verse 27. Is that, yeah, verse 27. He says, For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Okay, well, somebody's going to say, okay, well, see there what it says. It says that they did. They only did what God said they would do. 
but, but what's he talking about? What, what, what is the context of what he's looking at? So what, what did the Gentiles and Pontius Pilate and the people of Israel do? What did they do? They rejected Jesus and they crucified him. Okay, so he's saying that they crucified Jesus and that was God's predestined plan before time began. And we're going to see that in scripture. Another thing that you need to do, and I know it's difficult for some of you, it's difficult for me a lot of the time. When you read scripture, you need to remember what the rest of scripture says, okay? You need to remember things. You need to be able to pull things together and understand things. And don't just let one something stand on its own and say, well, that's, that's it. That's what the Bible teaches on this when it doesn't. And uh, we're going to see tonight there's a lot of verses that teach this, but there's a lot of verses that teach the other. And you have to find a balance. And there, there's got to be a teaching somewhere that teaches what the Bible says, that makes it clear. So he's talking about that they crucified Jesus, and they did what God had already predetermined or set limits would happen. And so when you think about that from God's point of view, before the Bible tells us, before the world began, God had a plan and a purpose. As a matter of fact, we're going to see a verse here in just a few minutes that says that Jesus was the lamb. You remember what it says? Slain when? Before the foundation of the world. So in God's mind, in God's purpose and plan, it was all settled and done. And so now you get into foreknowledge. God knew all of this going forward. And he put limits and he said, okay, here's what's going to happen. And what you're going to see in particular when we get to the book of Ephesians is that what God limited was salvation. There is only one way of salvation and that's in Christ. And so somebody would say, well, if, if that's the case, what would have happened? Because I believe that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, rode on the donkey and they were singing Hosanna, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the son of David. When they were doing that in that moment, whether they realized it or not, they were recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. They were recognizing the prophecies and they were saying, here's the Messiah. And then they turned right around and went against him and started yelling, crucify him. Well, let's just, what if we know that God's predetermined plan was Jesus to be crucified? What if on Palm Sunday they had received Jesus as Messiah? What if the Pharisees had come out? What if the Sanhedrin had come out and said, you know what, we were wrong. You have fulfilled these prophecies. You are the son of David, the Messiah, we receive you as such. What would have happened then? Would have that, would have that messed up God's plan? Would God's predetermined will, would that have been knocked out? No, because I can think just right off the top of my head two ways that Christ could have been crucified. The Romans, number one, could have got mad and said, hey, y'all can't worship him. Caesar's the king. The Romans could have come out and said, hey, y'all can't have a gathering like this. And since Jesus was the, the center of the gathering, they could have just taken him and crucified him. Or, as you know well as I do, you can't get uh, Jews, you can't get Baptists, you can't get anybody to be 100%. It just ain't going to happen. And there still could have been one or two or, or a group of Jews somewhere, maybe Judas still, that still betrayed him. And had him taken over. So there's no limit to how God could have fulfilled his will and had done what he wanted. And so what Peter is praying here and what he's telling us is he's saying, look, all of these people, they thought they were doing what they wanted to do. They thought that, that they were, were being gods themselves by deciding who would live and who wouldn't. But he said really what they were doing was they were fulfilling what you had already predetermined. So you might think, okay, well, that one is a, it's a little bit on the, on the predestination side. That's a little bit Calvinist there. So remember that the Bible says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Remember that there are other verses all the way through Scripture, all the way, beginning in Genesis chapter 3 and all the way through the book of Revelation where it talks about God wanting all people to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come. So you've got all of these things working and you see God's will and you see man at work in this world. So now move to Romans chapter 8. And look what's going on here. In Romans chapter 8. And let's begin reading in verse 28. And that will kind of kind of set the stage for us. 28 we know. that that's, that's our favorite verse. For we know. He says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so that tells us a couple of things. It tells us that God is at work in this world. And for those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose, it tells us that he is at work in all things for good, for our good. And then in verse 29 he says, first of all, for those he foreknew, so there's foreknowledge, and that's a different word than predestination, and it's got a different meaning. Those that he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be saved? Right. He didn't predestine them to be saved. He didn't predestine that, okay, these are going to be saved and these aren't. Those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, that can only happen after salvation. If you, re if you reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's not going to happen. Because you've already been, John chapter 3, condemned because of your unbelief. So those that he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Okay, now here's the, the next time that the word's used in verse 30. And he says, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Okay, so here now you need to remember some things. Who has Jesus called? When we, we talked about this Sunday morning, who does the Bible say that God called? Everybody. Everybody. No one comes to the Father unless they are drawn or they are called. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. I will call all men to me. So... When you read these passages, remember these things. Because in Scripture, the inspired, inerrant Word of God, which I believe with all my heart, you can't have one thing over here and another thing over here. If you do, you've got to find some way there's something. In the context, there's something. Either he's making a point or it's kind of like what we did with uh, uh, in Habakkuk. If y'all remember, we, we kind of went through this for a little while. Habakkuk chapter 1. Everybody says that God turned his back on Jesus on the cross. And they say the reason that he did is because, and then they quote Habakkuk chapter 1, God can't, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. And so I come to church next Sunday and I showed you 20 verses in the Bible where it says the Lord's eyes look at the sin of men. David said my sin is ever before, you know, on and on. So there's got to be an answer because the Bible obviously says in Habakkuk that God's eyes are too holy to look on evil. There's got to be an answer. Well, the answer is in Habakkuk, Habakkuk is praying. That's not a doctrinal statement. Habakkuk is praying and he's trying to um, bargain with the Lord because the Lord has told him that the Babylonians are coming to bring judgment on Israel. And Habakkuk is saying, Lord, you can't let that happen because the Babylonians are more wicked than we are. So how can you do that? And one of his arguments was, is you can't be looking at stuff like that, Lord. They're, they're more wicked. Well, Obviously, they weren't because God was judging Israel and not them. Now, he judged them later on, 
But do you see my point? You've got to remember things. You've got to read things and let things be what they are. And so when you read down through here, he says, okay. He says he predestinated some of them. That's exactly what he says. He says, and those he predestinated, he also called. What is predestination? Okay, the answer is in verse 29. He has predestined those who are saved to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, who were those that are saved? We saw it last Sunday. Those that he called and they responded to the call. And that's God's will. I, wish, I wrote down a bunch of verses to go with that. Another one is, is Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us, you know, to, to deny godliness and, and worldly lust. So he calls all people, and those that he called, he also justified. So did he justify everybody that he called? No, he justified those that responded to the call and were saved. So there's your two places where uh, predestination is used. Now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7 and 9. I'm in 2 Corinthians. I do that quite a bit. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 9. So he says, on the contrary, this is one of my favorite passages to teach on because it's another one of those that we, we use completely out of context. He says, on the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. Okay, what was predestined? Wisdom. Whatever that wisdom in, in mystery, whatever God's wisdom was in mystery is what he predestined. Read it again. He said, on the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom that God predestined before the ages for our glory. Now, verse 8, he takes it a step further. He said, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Remember I told you at the beginning that most of the times that predestination is used in the New Testament, it's tied to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So Paul is telling us here, he's saying, God had a hidden wisdom, a mystery, okay? Now, just real quick, when you read a mystery in the New Testament, that does not mean it's something that you can't know. It's just a mystery, and we can't know it. It's something that, and this is a good definition of it, it's a hidden wisdom. It's something that was talked about, was hinted at, that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, in particular in Christ, it finds its fulfillment. And that's why Paul uses the word mystery so much is because he is the one that revealed most of our New Testament doctrine. And when he talks about mystery, normally it concerns Jesus Christ or it concerns the church. And one of the big mysteries that Paul talks about in Romans and in Galatians is that the Jew and the Gentile would come together in one body, the church. In Jesus Christ. So a mystery, even though it was hidden wisdom, it's not something that we can't understand. It's not something that we'll never know. It's something that he hasn't completely revealed yet. And Paul tells us that this, this hidden wisdom in a mystery, it's a wisdom God predestined, he says, before the ages or before the world began. So back in eternity past. So what was it? Well, he says, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because he said if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So there's your first key to what this mystery was, this wisdom of God. Now, when you read the rest of the chapter, Paul's talking about 
salvation. Because he's saying that, that when you hear the words or the things of God to the natural man, it, it, it's foolishness. He, he, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand. But he said to us who are being saved, we understand. Romans chapter 1, the same way. He said the salvation, the grace of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. But to the world, they suppress it. They put it down. They can't, they can't understand it. So he's talking about the hidden wisdom of God that was predestined before the foundation of the world. And he says that if the world had known it and understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, that tells us a little bit about what this particular hidden wisdom was, our predestination. But then verse 9 gives us the rest of the story. And this is the verse that we so misinterpret. Verse 9, he says, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared these things for those who love him. And again, those of you that... You hear that at, at funerals a lot. Yes, and, and it's, it's wrong. So yeah. it, it, that's not the way it's... That's not what he's talking about. For most of us, heaven. That's the, well, that's heaven. Okay, if you got a good Bible, you're going to have some notes somewhere. And your notes for this verse 9 is going to take you back to Isaiah. In particular, Isaiah chapter 64. And when you get back to Isaiah chapter 64 and you read that, Isaiah is praying. And he's begging God. He's saying, Lord, I realize that my people are wicked. I realize that your judgment is fixing to come on them and you're fixing to put down that mount." Isaiah 64, 4. Yeah, it's on the back of your on the back of the page of predestination. Second paragraph. And he's praying, he's saying, Lord, I realize that, that you're fixing to, you know, come down on the people on the, the page with predestination on the front of it. Yeah. Look on the back there. And so he tells them, he said, he tells the Lord, he said, Lord, what we need is a revival, basically. We need you just to move through here. And he says, we need you to do it like you did back in Moses' day, back at Mount Sinai. When you came down, God came down and spoke to your people and moved among them. And he says, that is something that nobody, nobody, and he lumps all the foreign gods and all everything Nobody ever thought a God would come down and work among his people. Go back to Isaiah 64 when you get a chance and read that and see what he's saying. And Paul says that is the great mystery. That's the, the hidden wisdom of God, the thing that was predestined that God himself would come down to earth and intervene in man's affairs and in Christ Jesus offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin. And he said, if they had known that this was God himself, they wouldn't have crucified it. Which, by the way, this is another excellent defense for the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're one, but yet they're three people. And so Paul says, man, that was predestined. God had said, okay, here's how I'm going to save the world. Here's how I'm going to intervene and bring redemption to my creation. And it's going to be through my only begotten son who is going to come into the world, something that no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Man hadn't even conceived that God himself would come down and redeem his people. So predestination, so far, what has it really been about? It's been about salvation. It's been about Christ and those who have trusted him. So far, we've only seen one verse. And that was Romans 8, 29, that might have, Romans 8, 30, that might have lent itself to saying, okay, these were chosen and these weren't. Just one verse. And even in that verse, in the verse before it, he made it clear that predestined, meant that those that were saved were predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. So that brings us now to the last time, and that's going to be in the book of Ephesians. 
And what I did on your second page there, I printed out Ephesians chapter 1. I've got your notes. Huh? I have your notes. Oh, okay. You, you got mine? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, did you mark all of them? I no, I, I wrote, yeah, I wrote on all of them. I added because I, after I printed it out, I said, uh-oh. <laughs> so I wrote on all of them. Yeah. No. So, uh, so what I did is I printed out Ephesians chapter 1 for you. Was there reason for different color ink? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And I want to accomplish two things tonight. <laughs> First of all, I want to show you again a little bit of how I study, okay? And then I want you to see how that applies to this verse and to predestination that we're talking about. So mainly verses 1 through 13, but I included the whole chapter because, man, there's some good stuff even down at the end. But anyway, so he begins by saying, and, and this is in the Christian standard, so it may be a little different than your translation, but he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will to the faithful saints in Christ, in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the purpose, good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Verse 7, in him. When you... Do you, do you see the pattern there? That's the green I, I circled, first of all. In him. So when you read this passage, pick it up, verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth, in him. In him also we have received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. Verse 13, in him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Okay, now I'm sitting in my study, and, and I'm going to preach on Ephesians chapter 1, and so I'm working on this, I'm studying it, and I'm reading over it, and I'm meditating on it, and I begin to think, man, he says in him a lot. He, he, he keeps bringing that up in Christ, in him, by him, through him. <clears throat> so I'll go back and, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll go back and I, and I, and I circle it. I want to see. And man, that gummit, it's all the way through this passage. In him, in him, in him, in him. So when you read this, what then would you think? Well, what's the main ideal of this passage? Is it predestination? Because the word predestination is used twice in here. Is that the main ideal of this passage? Is that what Paul's trying to teach us is that we were predestined? That's not the main idea here. That's not what he's trying to get over. The first thing he wants us to know and to understand is that everything that we have, regardless of what it is, is in Christ. What was the thing that God predestined before the foundation of the world? In Christ, that Christ would be crucified, that Christ would be the salvation. Remember, the word predestinate means to limit. And so somebody said, well, you Christians, y'all are awfully narrow-minded. You say there's only one way. And I say, no, we don't. God says there's only one way. God put a limit on it. And he said, only in Christ. And when you read through here, you see passages like that where he says that in Christ by his blood 
that was shed on the cross by his sacrifice. So he's trying to drive home to us, first of all, that everything we have, be it salvation, be it blessings in heaven, be it being sealed until the day of redemption, everything we have is in Christ. Notice what he says in verse 13. I love this. In him, Christ, you were also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So who seals us? The Holy Spirit does. How does the Holy Spirit seal us? In Christ. And if you think about it, and if you remember some time in the past when you read in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit, remember Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Okay, well, he hadn't. He's not going to come to us, come back till rapture and second coming. So what's he talking about? He says, I will send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. I will come to you. So it's all in Christ. That's what Paul's trying to get us to understand. And then as you go through here, you say, okay, well, he does mention predestinate now. So, so this has got to be a, a predestination passage. Well, let's read it. So the words that, that are used with predestination are in purple, if I remember right. Did I? Yeah, God's predestined things are underlined in purple. Some of these may be a little bit hard to, to see. And then in yellow is the places where it says either he chose us, he predestined us, something to do with God's predestined will. There's no yellow on there. Huh? There's no yellow. There's no yellow on y'all's? Okay, what color did it? I put it in uh, green. green. I put it in green on yours. This, this is mine, Judy, that I'm, that I'm reading from. And, and I did this one before I did y'all's. Let me get one of y'all's. Yeah. Okay, purple is the predestined, as I said. So notice, first of all, in verse 4, for he chose us, okay? Notice verse 5, he predestined us. And then at the end of the verse, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then he mentions it again in verse 9, according to the good pleasure that he has purposed, and again, in Christ. Where did he purpose that good pleasure? In your salvation? In that you would be saved and somebody... Is that where he purposed his goodwill? In no, in Christ. In Christ. And then in verse 11, in him, we also received an inheritance because we were predestined to be saved? To predestined to not be saved? No, we were predestined according to the plan. Purpose. What was the plan? Christ. We've already seen that. The mystery that was hidden before ages that no man could think of, no eye had seen, no ear had heard, that God would come in the flesh and offer himself as the sacrifice for our sins. So the thing I want you to get above anything else tonight is, is that when you read something, you can't just build a whole doctrine, a whole denomination on one verse. You've got to read it all. You've got to study it and see what it's saying. Now, take it one step further. <clears throat> in yours, look at the blue. And let's begin in verse 4, because the blue is us. This is either what we're required to do or what happened to us. So in verse 4, he says, he chose us. So there you go. We're, we're chosen. How are we chosen? In him, for what? And he goes even further before the foundation of the world, okay? But what are we chosen for? For salvation? Does the Bible say that he chose us to be saved? No. We're chosen to be holy and blameless in love before Christ. That's Christians, not lost people. Go back to Romans 8, 29. What did it say? For those that he predest those that he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
not salvation. Okay, the next blue one. Let me see. Where is it at? Uh, verse 5. He predestined us to what? To be saved? To adoption as his sons. And what does that do? Technically, scripturally, that's what gives us inheritance in Christ. Because as not as adopt, not as sons, we, we're without Christ in the world, Paul says. We, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from God, without hope in the world. Now that we have been adopted, we now have inheritance. We are now brought into the family and given rights as a son. And then uh, verse, uh, I believe the next one is verse 12. He says, and so that, and just think about that for a minute. What have I been saying about predestination? It either deals with the cross of Christ or it deals with Christians after they are saved. To be made into the image of Christ Jesus, uh, to be uh, holy and blameless in love, all of these things. What does he say then in verse 12? He says, so that we who had already believed, already put our hope, we're in Christ. So we were, we're saved. We've already put our hope in Christ. And how did we do that? Verse 13, in him, again, in him also you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When? When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and what? And when you believed. Now, folks, that's the way you study the Bible. And that's the way you understand what the Bible says. And then to make it even better, notice the red right in the middle of the passage. Notice what he says. He made known to us the mystery of his will. So where have we heard that before? That was in the other passage about predestination. In Acts, the mystery. What God, and then in 1 Corinthians... The hidden mystery that God now revealed to us. So he has made known to us. What has he made known to us? The mystery of his will. It was a mystery. It was a hidden thing in the Old Testament. But now he's made known to us. According to the good pleasure that he purposed. Where? In Christ. And then he goes further. He says as part, as a plan for the right time okay now think back to the definition of predestination god limited out in the future so part of that limiting out is going to be not only the plan the purpose that salvation is in christ and christ alone it's also going to be as the apostle paul said at just the right time Christ was born. And you can apply this to the second coming also. That's an, a, another thing that I don't understand about some of these people, in particular the Praetorists, who all believe that all of prophecy, everything in the book of Revelation and everything in Matthew chapter 24, all of it was fulfilled in A.D. 70. And there is no future prophecy. And when we read the book of Revelation, we are to read it as a symbolic pastoral thing. In other words, we are simply to take comfort in the fact that Christ is going to win. That, that's all it is. But every one of them will stand up and preach their heart out telling you that Christ was the Messiah because he literally fulfilled every promise in the Old Testament and every prophecy about himself. So my question is, why would God go to so much trouble to fulfill literally every promise and prophecy about his first coming and then just tell us it's a joke and laugh about his second coming? He's not. All of those prophecies are going to be literally fulfilled also because God has predestined. He has limited out what's going to happen. And he said, this is when and this is how in Christ. Okay, so what is the mystery? Verse, 18, verse 10, as a plan for the right time, and here you go, to bring everything together in Christ. Whether things in heaven or things on earth, in him. So what is predestined? Is it salvation? Can, 
can you read any of these passages except that one verse in Romans chapter 8? Can you read any of these passages and come away and say, God has predestined me to be saved and you to be lost? Can you do that? If you can, it's because you made up your mind before you started reading. And you said, okay, this is what it says and this is what it's going to be. Because it doesn't say that anywhere. To me, after studying, after pouring over this, reading and, and putting all this together, it clearly says that what has been predestinated before the foundation of the world is that Jesus Christ would come and offer himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And what has been predestinated is those that receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Remember, we saw Sunday in Revelation chapter 3 and 4 where faith in God's eyes is not a work. It's not something that we do. It's something he gives us. So to say we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ is not taking anything away from God. We responded to the call of God. And he says, when you respond to my call, as Paul said here, what did he say? Who had already put our hope in Christ. When we responded, verse 15, to the word of truth, God said, hey, now that you're mine, my plan's going to kick in in your life. Now things are limited out. Number one, you're going to be conformed into the image of my son. Number two, you've got all of these blessings that I've given you, and they're all in Christ. Number three, I'm going to bring everything together in Christ Jesus, and because you were in Christ, you're going to be a part of that. You're going to have, verse 11, an inheritance, and then, verse 12, verse 13, I'm going to seal you in Christ until that day. That's predestination. That's every place in the Bible that it's used. And, and I hope I haven't muddled this up and, and confused you, but that's how predestination is used in Scripture. It has nothing to do with salvation as in who will be saved and who won't. It has everything to do with God saying, I am predestinating, I am limiting that salvation is in my son Jesus Christ and I am limiting that when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior here's what's going to happen to you and another thing if you want to take it to some outer edges of the teaching remember Job Job Satan come up and said well don't read Job serves you because you're taking care of it that's predestination that's God limiting out what can happen to his people and the only way anything can break into that plan as if God allows it, as in the picture in the book of Job. And then I wanted you to see verse 17 and 18 because Paul prays for the, um, the people here at Ephesus. <clears throat> and he says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And I pray that your eye, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And so what I want you to see there is that the Holy Spirit's at work in our lives each and every day. And that's why I harp so much on change. If, if you haven't changed since last month, if you haven't changed since last year, especially if you haven't changed since you professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, something's wrong. Either you're not saved or you are so backslidden, as I said Sunday morning, that you're useless. There will be change. And look at the power that he talks about as he's praying this. Verse 19, he says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe there's your predestination again. According to the mighty working of his strength. Okay, how mighty is that strength? He exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. So the same power that God exerted 
in Christ's resurrection, that's the power that's at work in you and me. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and me. And so if God can't change you, as I said just a while ago, it can only be for one of two reasons. Number one, you're not a Christian. And number two, you're just so backslidden that God, like he told the Israelites, I give up. I'm going to send you into exile <laughs> because you're not listening. You won't even try. So any questions, any comments? Next week, we're going to look further at some of the other things. Uh, on your uh, page, uh, the one that's got predestination on the front and something on the back, there at the bottom, you'll notice that along with election, it is obvious that God did some choosing or electing in the Bible. And again, you cannot read Scripture and not see that. There, it, it, there's some in there. And so the prime example is the nation Israel, and they are God's chosen people. And he told them that he didn't choose them because they were the greatest or the largest in number, but because he chose them out of his wisdom and his purposes. So next Wednesday night, we're going to look at, in particular, Romans chapter 9 and 10 and 11, do a brief overview of that, and look at how God's election works and who is elected. Because now we know that predestination and election chosen are not the same thing. So you can walk out of here tonight knowing that God's predestined will is at work in your life right now. God is predestined that you will be conformed to the image of his son. And one of the primary ways he does that is back in Romans, Romans chapter 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. There you go. Any questions? Anything? Y'all quit I had, that. I had a uh, <laughs> professor who told a story about, and I can't remember if it was an old Puritan or a Quaker or somebody. He, was, he believed in predestination in the form of that when your time had come, your time had come to die. And he's, he was going to church and he, he hooked, harnessed up his, his horse to the buggy and he, but he laid his old gun in there, his, his old uh, muzzleloader, and somebody was standing there and said, Hey, Brother said, you believe in predestination. Why are you taking that gun? Because you believe when your time's come, your time's come. He said, well, on, on the way to church, I might meet an Indian whose time has come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And somebody told, uh, I believe it was Brother J. Vernon McGee, and he was telling him that, uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, I, I, if it's not my time, he said, I can walk out there in the middle of that freeway, yeah. and it's not my time. And Brother McGee said, yeah, and if... You walk out there, it's, it's your, gonna time. Be your time. <laughs> it's going to be your time. So, and we're going to look at that a little bit next week, too, within God's will, because God has a determined plan and purpose for the world. He allows free will. And one of my arguments with when, when I do talk to Calvinists and we discuss things is God is so sovereign. See, that's their problem. They say that if we say that we believed in Christ, as Paul says, then God didn't save us. We saved us because we believed in Christ, okay? Well, I showed you already Romans, faith is not a work, and you see where Paul just said it over and over. My point is, is that God gave us free will. We saw that all the way in the garden, and we're going to see it all the way to the revelation. And God is so sovereign, regardless of what I choose, his plan is going to come to pass. God doesn't need me. God is allowing me by grace to be a part of his plan and purpose. So if you really get down to the nuts and bolts, my God's more sovereign than, than their God's is. And as I said Sunday morning, what kind of God is it that has to make you get saved and worship him? Anyway, anything? Okay, well, next week we'll look at a little bit more into this. Uh, remember, Sunday morning is uh, homecoming at 1030, not, not 945 and not 11. Not 11. So, um, <laughs> Stuart, no wonder you can't catch no fish. <laughs> Get that woman out your boat. Yeah. Were you in your boat? Is that that's what it looked like to me? Once more time. When you were kissing on her. Oh. <laughs> yeah.
I thought so. I said, you can't catch fish like that. That's why I don't take Charlene fishing with me. <laughs> Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. Thank you for coming tonight. Father, we just love you and we praise you. Lord, you've been so good to us by your predestined grace. And Lord, I thank you that it is in Christ Jesus and not in me. And I thank you that salvation is by and through him, not in me. And Lord, I can stand here tonight knowing that I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit and I'm waiting for the trumpet to sound because of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Father, be with us now as we go. Help us to witness. Help us to minister to those that are hurting. And help us to share your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.